Um, I'm Ian Covert. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. And uh, the subject of this talk, uh, like Atiyah said, is uh, our recent paper. It's called Explaining by Removing a Unified Framework for Model Explanation. Um, and this is about, like you said, um, uh, explainable machine learning is becoming pretty popular. If you use a black box machine learning model and you want to say something about how it works, then you might turn to an explainability method like SHAP or LIME. And, um, you know, other times people might be coming in and they'll be saying, uh, you know, here's a new method. You should think about using this method. In this talk, um, I'm going to be uh, introducing a framework for um, basically classifying a bunch of these methods in one bucket and saying they're all based on uh, one shared principle, which is removing sets of features to understand their influence, right? Um, and um, because the literature is so big and there are a ton of methods, uh, like, like Gautier said, um, it's going to make it a lot easier to navigate and like understand the literature if we can see these like underlying similarities that I don't think are really fully exposed in the original papers. So yeah, um, that's uh, what uh, this uh, paper was about. Um, it's uh, one that I wrote in collaboration with Scott Lundberg. He's the SHAP guy. Um, so if you haven't heard of him, you've probably heard of SHAP. And then uh, Sue and Lee, our advisor at the University of Washington. Um, and it's kind of a long paper. There's a lot of interesting content in there and we're not gonna get into all of it right now. So if you find, um, you know, what you hear today interesting, then maybe you'll check out the paper. Okay. So here is a roadmap for the talk. Um, we're more or less gonna try to track the contents of the paper. Um, but before jumping in, I'm gonna start by like motivating the area of research a little bit. Okay, so with modern machine learning, black box models are becoming increasingly popular. And we've moved towards these models like neural networks, random forests, and so on, um, because their performance is so much better than classical models. Um, but there's been some resistance to um, the idea of relying on models uh, that we can't really understand. We don't know why they make their predictions. Um, the field of explainable AI provides solutions to that problem um, with tools that give transparency into how a model works. Um, so this is an emerging field that's becoming more important as machine learning is becoming more widespread. Um, but when you know when you get to the point where you have a black box model that you want to deploy, maybe your company, and you want to provide transparency to your users, or you want to provide transparency within your organization, you'll you'll have to ask this question: which explainability methods should we rely on? And when you look into this, you'll discover that there are a lot of options. There are like hundreds of explainability papers. Um, many of them are proposing a new method and every method gives a different answer about how the model works. So, you know, you can just load the package and run the method, but every method will tell you a different thing. Um, so with this many options, and you don't need to read through them all, the points is just that there are a ton. Um, it's not easy to understand everything that's out there and uh, which ones will make the most sense for you. So we should ask ourselves, um, is the field in a good place right now? You know, how, how much has it progressed? And the first thing to say is that there's actually been a lot of progress in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, the first, the first uh, papers that I saw um, talking about interpretability for neural networks um, aren't that old. So in a pretty short amount of time, people have developed lots of great methods. Um, but we should also acknowledge some problems that might, you know, will hopefully be addressed in the next couple of years. And uh, one to mention is that the field is uh, fragmented. There are tons of papers and they're all over the place with the disorganized methods explaining, uh, sorry, exploring uh, many different ideas about how to explain how models work. Um, so the field is, fragmented right now, uh, you, you may be even sprawling. Uh, it's just very hard to, to manage and it's growing right now, still very fast. Papers are coming out pretty pretty frequently and it's gonna be really hard to keep up with it and unless maybe you're an academic and it's your job. Um, and in these papers, um, there also isn't a lot of discussion of the like underlying principles that connect a lot of methods. 
I think there's like an incentive to put out a paper and say, here's the new method. You should, you should think about running this uh, instead of the previous methods. But um, maybe there isn't enough incentive to say, you know, what, when you introduce a new method, what it has in common with a bunch of existing methods. Maybe it's just a little variation on an existing method. And if there are some shared elements, there should be a big discussion of, you know, why those shared elements make sense because there are so many different approaches. So with this talk, we're gonna try to fix some of those problems. And the first thing we'll talk about is a new unifying theory that connects uh, more than 20 existing methods. Uh, we're gonna see that they have a lot of shared elements and then we're gonna talk about why those shared elements make sense. Um, and this unifying theory, you'll have this new perspective. And I hope that instead of uh, seeing complicated monolithic algorithms in each explanation, each explanation method, you'll see that they're actually very similar methods composed of different but interchangeable choices. And uh, through all this, we're gonna be delving into one key idea about how to understand models. And uh, that is uh, understanding the importance of features by removing their influence and seeing how the model's behavior changes. Okay, so let's jump into talking about what the framework is. So the title of the paper is Explaining by Removing, but what does it mean? Well, we observed that many explanation methods implicitly are simulating feature removal. And just intuitively what that means is we have a model that makes certain predictions, but we can imagine um, turning off a set of features. Um, imagine that they don't exert influence on the model and um, the predictions should change. You know, maybe if you're predicting the probability that someone's going to repay a loan and you imagine you didn't know their credit score, the model's prediction might change by a lot. Uh, and that's what simulating feature removal is about. Um, but removing features from a model is actually a non-trivial operation because, as you know, if you've ever used scikit-learn or any machine learning package, the API is that you need to provide all the features. So when you're simulating feature removal, um, you need to be a little bit clever about that. You can't just not give the model access to a feature and different explainability methods take different approaches to this operation. Uh, and we'll see that, yeah, they're all based on feature removal, but then there, there are further differences in how they generate the final explanation, whether it's SHAP or LIME, there's some big differences. Um, so the point is um, we're gonna tie all of them together by talking about feature removal, but um, there is a lot of diversity in these methods. And uh, you know, we asked ourselves, can we capture them all in one framework? Uh, it wasn't obvious that you could make a framework that has the right degrees of freedom, but we think we figured it out. So by the way, to give you an idea of the methods we're talking about, here's the list from before. I've bolded the ones that uh, are based on feature removal. And uh, you don't need to look at all of them, but uh, you'll see that uh, many of the most popular methods are based on feature removal. So like SHAP, LIME, um, if, you, if you've ever done computer vision, you've probably heard of occlusion. Um, if you like reading these papers, you might've heard of L2X. Um, uh, meaningful perturbations is another nice computer vision one. Um, so anyway, these are just some of the methods that are based on feature removal that are going to be in this new class. Okay, so here's the framework that we came up with to uh, unify these methods that we call removal-based explanations. And the point of this framework is to show that all of these methods are determined, each one, by uh, different combinations of three choices. You just need to make three choices to specify one of these methods. And here they are. The first choice is how to remove features. Um, so your model typically has access to all the features, but we want to simulate feature removal. Imagine evaluating the model without giving it the credit score. Um, and like I said, it's not as simple as just not giving the model access to the credit score. You need to choose some way of performing feature removal. Um, and there are several options for how to deal with this just intuitively. Maybe you could have some default value for the features that you're removing. Um, if you want to uh, do something a little less clunky than that, then maybe you'll say, 
well, okay, if we don't know the value, then let's uh, consider a bunch of different possible values and average the model's predictions over those different values. Um, so diff different options for when you're removing features from the model. Uh, and I think I can see that there are a lot of questions right now. Uh, uh, yes, it depends. Do you want to fill the questions after your talk or in during the talk? Uh, it's, it's really up to you. Uh, the question so far, it was uh, really, uh, will you share your slides afterward? Uh, oh, uh, sure. And also uh, one, one question, which is more like with applications in mind is like, um, so, so I know because I read your paper that it's quite, um, uh, quite a, a math point of view, but if you have like special, um, special insight in applying these methods for time series, uh, that would be appreciated by, by Giorgio at least. Mm, okay, that's a good question. But let's leave that, let's leave that one for the end. Because um, right. it doesn't fit in super well. Sorry, I saw the number of chats go up to like seven, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, did I say something uh, really confusing?" But, okay, um, yeah, I'll share the slides and let's get to the time series thing later. Um, okay, so getting back to it, like I said, we have this framework. Each method just makes three choices. The first choice is how you're going to simulate feature removal. The second choice is. Um, when you remove features from the model, you want to see how the model's behavior changes because the predictions are going to change. But you need to choose specifically which model behavior you're going to look at. So one thing you could do is you could just look at how an individual prediction changes as different features are removed. You could also look at how the loss for an individual prediction changes. Um, and you could also, you could even look at how the data set loss changes as different features are removed. So if you remove the, the credit score feature for uh, everyone in your data set, it's sort of like you're just not giving the model access to that information. And presumably you'll see the data set loss uh, go up because you've deprived it of a useful feature. So uh, yeah, the second choice is just specifically which aspect of the model's behavior you look at as you remove different features. Okay, and the third choice is um, when you are generating an explanation, the idea is that it's based on how the model, how the predictions change when different features are removed, but we can remove different subsets of features, right? In fact, an exponential number of subsets of features, we can remove any possible subset of features and see how the model changes. Um, but that's that's like a tremendous amount of information. If we have like n features, then it's two to the n subsets that we can remove. Um, all that's useful information. It would give the the user um, some insight into how the model's working. But it, like I said, it's just too many numbers. It's too much information. So the third choice is some kind of summary technique that collapses all of that down into something that's um, small enough that a person can look at it and understand. Um, and so oftentimes the summary technique produces one score per feature, and uh, that's usually called a feature attribution. And that's what, what we have here. It's a little bar chart. Um, and there, there are many different options for this. So yeah, the, this third choice is just how you um, summarize the, the results of removing different subsets of features um, to make it something concise, presentable for the user. Okay, so uh, that, that was a little bit fast on each of these choices. So we'll, let's just go over them again, um, each one in a little, little bit more detail. So for the feature removal thing, um, like I was saying, the model, which we'll denote as little f, um, models, almost every model is set up so that it requires a specific set of features. Um, and you could denote this as a function that for every input in the input domain, uh, produces some prediction, um, but you really need to give all the features like a decision forest or a neural network. You can't give it just a subset of features, right? Um, but when removing features to say, you know, we remove a feature, let's see how the model changes. That tells us something about its role in the model. When removing features, we kind of want to just not provide them to the model and see how the predictions change, right? So in the paper, 
to represent that, um, we denote uh, a subset function using capital F. And this is a function um, whose role is to take a subset of features. So for every input vector in the input domain and for a subset of the feature indices, uh, where we have D total features, one through D, um, X sub S is gonna be that subset of the features. And you can just give that to the model or when, when you're working with a subset function, this is something that we define. Um, and the way that you set up your subset function based on little f is your choice for how to remove features. And I'll go through a couple of specific ones here, but like I said, like default values is an easy option um, and marginalizing over some distribution of possible values for the missing features is another option. Okay, for the model behavior, um, you know, when you give the model all the features in this little cartoon right now, we're imagining that all the features are on, the model makes a certain prediction, but there's a little animation coming. When we turn off a couple of features or remove them, the model's behavior changes, the predictions change. Um, but you can look at the prediction, you can look at the loss. So th the way that we say this in the paper is you need to choose a target quantity to explain and this is broad enough to allow for a couple possibilities. Um, so you can look at, let's just say you have one prediction, it's like one customer, right? And the model says a certain thing for that customer, um, but you can turn different features on and off. And for each subset of features, you'll be looking at the, the output for that set of features. So this is one target quantity that you can be looking at, just an individual prediction. Alternatively, this is a little variation on that. Um, you can look at the loss for an indiv indiv individual prediction if you know the label and see how the loss goes up and down. Um, and you can also look at the data set loss, um, how, the models how the model's performance goes up and down as you remove different features. And for all of these options, one of the important things to set up right now is on the left-hand side, that notation is for a set function. This is a function where you give it a subset and on the right-hand side, you're getting a real valued number, right? Okay, so when you're choosing a model behavior, like in the end, you're really just setting up one of these set functions. Okay, now for the summary technique, um, you know, so like I said before, it's like you can remove every subset of features and see what the model's behavior is, but that's an exponential number of subsets. Maybe that's too many. Um, so what do we do? We need to give a more concise explanation than that. So um, I'll tell you how that's done. So recall in, you know, in the previous slide, we said that your every method has some underlying set function where you give it a subset and it gives you a real value number. It's a little bit like a company that has, you know, a universe of possible employees. And when they all choose to work for the company, the company has a certain profitability. Um, but if you remove a couple employees, then the profitability changes. Remove a couple more employees and the profitability changes again. And by considering different sets of employees, seeing how when you remove one guy or you add one girl, how the profitability goes up and down, uh, you can begin to understand each employee's contribution to the company's profitability, right? And we have an exactly analogous situation with the removal of features, because as we bring different features in and out, uh, we can see the like an individual prediction going up and down, the loss going up and down. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there are some intuitive ways of getting at, you know, which are the important employees? How important is each employee? Um, and the role of this third choice is to uh, give a concise summary of each employee's importance. So there, there are a couple uh, types of explanations or summaries. Um, the first one is a feature attribution. And you've probably heard of this one, like SHAP, for example, and gives a score to each feature. And there are different ways to calculate scores. The point is that there are different options and SHAP is just one, but there are other ones. Um, so here's a simple one. You can remove, it's like removing an individual employee. So with all the employees, there's a certain amount of profit. If you remove a single employee, the profitability changes. And by looking at the difference, you can say, 
Well, that is the degree of importance that that employee has. And we could call that the remove individual strategy. Another one is you can include individual employees. So with no employees, there's a certain profitability. And then if you have a single employee, then the profitability changes. And you can look at the delta and say, that is the importance that we attribute to that employee. There are a number of different options, not just those two. Um, and instead of feature attributions, some methods do feature selections, where instead of giving a score to each feature, they just say, here's the subset of features that are the most influential. And so instead of giving a score to every employee, the explanation kind of looks like this. It's just, here are the most influential employees. And like, like how there are different ways of generating feature attributions, there are also different ways of um, generating feature selections. And if you really want to see all the options that um, we observed in the literature, then you'll probably want to check out the paper because for each method, we really go through the three choices that they make. We do that for every method. It's hard to list them all right now, but um, actually the next thing that I wanted to do is to show you these three choices for a couple example methods to make it more palpable. Okay, so the first method we'll talk about is Lime. And our goal, you know, this is a very well-cited uh, paper. It was really influential at the time. A lot of people still use it. It's a great paper. And we're gonna try to distill it down to three points. What are the three choices they make? Because this method falls into our framework. So we're just gonna really distill it down. So um, Lime, when it removes features in the context of images, at least, it just replaces the missing pixels with some default value. It just sets them to black or it sets them to gray. And that's what Lime does um, when removing features. So that's the first choice that it makes. The second choice that it makes regarding the model behavior that we observe as different features are removed, well, Lime is designed to uh, explain individual predictions. So it's just looking at for an individual image, for example, uh, how that prediction, like the, the log it or the probability goes up and down as different features are removed. And the summary technique is, you know, you can remove every possible subset of pixels and look at how the prediction changes, right? But that's too much information. Lime to give a score to each feature fits a linear model to its underlying set function. And in the paper, we say this in a really precise way. I think it's pretty convincing, but I'm sparing you the equations here uh, and just saying it's fitting a linear model. Um, but that's what it does. By fitting a linear model, there's a coefficient for each feature. And that coefficient is the score for that feature. It says um, to what degree that feature drives the prediction up or down. Okay, so that's Lime for you. Just tried to distill it down to its three choices. Um, next one we'll talk about is SHAP. If you're interested in explainability, then I'm sure you heard of SHAP also. And it's a super well-cited paper. It's, there's a lot of interesting content in there. And we're gonna try to boil it down to just three choices. So the first choice, when removing features, SHAP, instead of replacing them with the default values, says, well, we don't know the value. It could be any number of things. So let's consider a range of possible values, some distribution look at the prediction for each candidate value, average them, and that's what we'll do. We don't know a feature's value, and we call that marginalizing out those missing features. Okay, the model behavior that's analyzed with SHAP, it's just like Lime, it looks at an individual prediction, how the prediction goes up and down as different features are removed. But for the summary technique, it does something different. It calculates the Shapley values, of the underlying set function, whereas Lime is fitting a linear model. So this is a different choice that you can make for the summary technique. Okay, and we'll just do one more of these methods, um, permutation tests. Um, you may have seen this one actually, uh, Leo Bremen suggested that people do this for random forests, but they work with uh, any uh, type of machine learning model. Actually, most of these methods are model agnostic. Um, okay. So when removing features of the permutation test says, I don't know this feature, I'm gonna consider a range of possible values and average the predictions over those values. It's marginalizing the features out just like SHAP. Um, 
for the model behavior that is explained. Instead of looking at an individual prediction permutation test, look at how the model's loss averaged across the data set goes up and down as different features are removed. So that's different from shaft, different from line. And the third choice, the summary technique is removing individual features from the whole set of features. And uh, it's like this little cartoon that I showed you a couple slides ago. You have a certain accuracy given all the features, and then you can remove just one feature, see how the accuracy changes. It'll probably go down. And you look at that delta, and that is how important that feature is according to your permutation test. So, uh, you know, we just did that for three methods, but in the paper, we went through this process over and over for a number of methods uh, with the idea of showing that, look, all of these methods are really just variations on one another. They just make these three choices. Uh, and this table kind of sums it all up. In each row, there's a different method. And in each column, we list the three choices. Um, so we found that there are like 25 methods, basically, that are described by this framework. Removal-based explanations, where you can have a complicated explanation for it, but at the end of the day, they're just choosing a certain way to remove features. They're choosing a certain model behavior to look at, and they're choosing a summary technique to collapse it into a simple explanation that can be presented to a user, like a feature attribution. So this is over 20 methods. Um, it's a lot of the most popular ones, like uh, SHAP, LIME, Meaningful Perturbations, Permutation Test, L2F, L2X, et cetera. Um, it includes both local and global explanation methods. You may have heard that term before. Local methods explain individual predictions. Global methods somehow um, explain the model's behavior across the entire data set. And both types of methods fall into this framework. And uh, we also capture both feature attribution methods and feature selection methods. So <clears throat> it's a big framework. It connects pretty disparate parts of the literature, which is helpful because the literature is very big right now. OK, another cool figure that we have is if you take that table and uh, you try to visualize it, uh, then this is what you get. Along the vertical axis, we have the different feature removal methods. Along the horizontal axis, we have the different summary techniques, and we use the colors to indicate the model behavior that's being explained. And in each cell, we put the methods that do those things. So with this, you can see that you can see where each method is. You can see uh, its neighbors. Um, so yeah, we think of this as the space of removal-based explanations. Uh, it's interesting to know which methods are neighbors. If they share one or more choices, then they're very similar methods. They have similar motivations. will probably produce a similar result. Um, and by looking at this grid, you can see you know, certain methods that are spatially isolated. They're very unique. Um, any grid cell that's empty is a potential new method that hasn't been developed yet. It's kind of a hybrid between existing methods. So every grid cell here is just a new method waiting to be developed. Um, <coughs> it doesn't guarantee it's a good method though. So you gotta think about that. Okay, so that kind of, um, that's what I wanted to say about the framework and we'll have more to say, um, but I'll also just um, say quickly right now, uh, in terms of implementation, um, basically every method that we refer to here has an existing implementation on GitHub. Um, <coughs> we have our own GitHub though for this paper. And uh, the reason is we wanted to provide a simple implementation that supports uh, many of these methods. And the reason it's easy to make a single implementation that supports all of these methods, you know, that's, that should seem a little bit surprising because SHAP, for example, is a huge package. Lime is a pretty big package. Um, so we can implement them all at once. The reason is, you know, the whole point of this is that these methods rely on just some way of removing features, uh, some selection of a model behavior to explain, and some summary technique. So the point is, they have a very similar um, backbone in terms of software. Um, so the way we wrote this, um, we really focused on how just interchangeable these choices are. So in this implementation, you really just say, here's how I want to remove features. 
here's the model behavior I want to focus on. And here's the summary technique that I want. And like on the fly, it kind of connects those together and says, okay, here's the method that we're going to use to do an explanation here. And we use this to run our experiments. Um, so you might be interested in checking it out. Um, but of, like I said, there are those existing implementations. So, okay. So just to summarize what we've said so far, um, we have this new class of methods. We call them removal-based explanations, and they're all based on feature removal. And we developed this framework that shows that each method is just specified by three choices. There's three choices that you have to make. It's like a recipe for a new method or a simple way to understand a lot of existing methods. And um, this is kind of to transition to what comes next. Our framework has a three degrees of freedom and kind of offers a lot of flexibility. You know, if you want to do a removal-based explanation, you have a lot of options because you just need to make three choices. Um, but, you know, we should ask ourselves, is every set of choices okay? Is every set of choices equally good? Are there methods in that space that um, make more sense than others? You know, like where, where do we go from here now that we know all these methods are connected? What does it mean for us? So two, a couple key questions that um, I think motivate the rest of the discussion are one, if all these methods rely on feature removal, it's pretty important to know, is feature removal a smart approach to model explanation? So we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about, you have to make a choice for each dimension, right? There's three choices, you have to make a choice. So it'd be good to know, are there right choices? These are the two things that we'll talk about um, as we get towards the end here. Okay, so first, why feature removal? Hopefully it's a good idea. Um, and the paper says a lot about this. I'm just gonna do one slide to go through a couple points. So the first thing is, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? That, um, you know, without, without this paper having existed and saying that feature removal is like a, a good idea and a smart approach, a lot of research groups kind of independently converged on this idea, not even realizing that they're all doing the same thing. So there must be something kind of intuitive about it, right? Um, so what is intuitive about it? We tried to think about what feature removal really is kind of on, in a psychology sense. And I think the most helpful way of framing it is that it, it is a form of counterfactual reasoning. I don't know if you've like heard of counterfactuals, but the idea is, you know, the world is a certain way. It has a certain set of facts and then you get a certain outcome, but you can imagine sort of parallel world where a couple facts change and, um, you know, pe people use this in the context of like, if you get into a car crash, well, you can think about the set of things that occurred in the day leading up to the car crash. And then you can imagine a parallel universe where you made a couple different choices. And then you can sort of simulate what I still get into the car crash. And by going through this process, you can understand the world a little bit better and understand maybe what caused the car crash. And with model explanation, it's kind of similar. You can do counterfactuals to say, what if like what went into the model was different? How would the model's prediction change? And you'll learn something about what's causing the model's behavior. So that's what feature removal is. But with feature removal, we are changing the act of observing information rather than changing what was observed. So we're not saying, let's imagine the credit score was a different value. We're saying, imagine there was no credit score and the model had to like make its prediction without the credit score. It's a little bit different, but I think uh, in a way, this is just what feature removal is doing. And this idea of imagining that something didn't happen and then imagining the, the impact on the outcome, it's probably pretty intuitive to people. You know, you, you just remove something's influence, see what changes. And that's kind of how you understand that thing's influence. But, uh, you know, this is intuitive, but it's also anchored in psychology where it's called a subtractive counterfactual and it's anchored in philosophy where uh, John Stuart Mill called it the method of difference. So I think it's already pretty intuitive to people. You know, you understand something's influence by removing its influence and looking at the impact. Um, but it's also pretty grounded in the social sciences. So that 
briefly is why uh, we think that feature removal is a pretty smart approach to model explanation. The paper has more to say about this, but we'll leave it at that for now. And uh, lastly, we'll address that other question. Uh, are there right choices in each dimension of the framework? So recall, here's, here's the figure that I had before in our framework. Uh, every method is specified by three choices. Um, and there are different options for each choice. And with these different options, there are conceptual trade-offs, there are computational trade-offs. Um, some choices are gonna make more sense than others. And um, right, right choices is probably too strong of a word because every method is gonna have something to offer. Like every method like very literally answers some question about how the model works. Um, so right is probably a little bit too strong, but I will delve into a couple options that in the paper we, we focus on more because we think they're pretty compelling options and are maybe good choices for like a general use case explainability method. Right. Okay. So when it comes to feature removal, the choice that we focused on the most in the paper is marginalizing out features with their conditional distribution. And just to put that intuitively, it says we have a model, we have a certain set of features. Of course, we can evaluate the model with all the features, but let's imagine we want to remove a couple of them. What do we do? So what this means to marginalize out features with their conditional distribution, what it means is we say, okay, we don't have these features. We don't know what their values are, but let's consider a range of possible values. And in fact, let's say with the features that we do know, there's some distribution over the features that we don't. So we can draw samples from that conditional distribution, look at the model's prediction for each set of values, and then average the predictions. And that's what we'll say the prediction is given a subset of features. So that's marginalizing out features of their conditional distribution. Um, if you're familiar with like the SHAP literature, there's been a lot of discussion of this approach and it turns out that it's pretty difficult to implement. Um, but in the paper, we show that there are something like five other approaches that can be viewed as just approximations to that, which is pretty good news because it's kind of been an open problem um, how to uh, actually implement this. And it turns out there, there are a handful of pretty good approximations. Um, and the, one of the big reasons why we focused on this is we figured out that if you remove features in this way, marginalize them out with their conditional distribution, then explanation methods have an information theoretic meaning. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the field of information theory, but it's a way of quantifying uh, basically how much information is provided by um, like knowing a feature's value. And it's good to know that Model, like model explanation techniques, you know, the, the literature is big because there are a million ways to say how a model works, right? Um, but some ways are gonna be like convenient and kind of heuristic. They're not gonna be well-grounded. This is a way of grounding some explanation methods and saying, look, they're linked to information theory. It's not a heuristic. It's literally quantifying how much information is provided by different features. So that was good news, but that, that this all hinges on removing features in this way, marginalizing them out with their conditional distribution. So that's the choice that we thought was pretty compelling. Okay, and I'm just gonna say a little bit more about what that means um, in case you're not like super familiar with this part of the literature. So to make it intuitive, imagine a chest X-ray. You go to your doctor, you say, doc, does it look like I have, you know, COVID actually, <laughs> they can um, use chest x-rays to diagnose if you have COVID these days. So <clears throat> let's say the doctor says, it looks like you have COVID. Well, to understand what in this x-ray looks like COVID, what you could do is you could um, black out parts of the image and um, say, well, what about now? And when you black out the part that looks like COVID, Hopefully they'll say, well, now it doesn't look like you have COVID and you know that you've covered up the, the evidence for that. So it's sort of like this, you wanna block out a region, right? But how should a doctor interpret you blacking out that region? Cause that's, this is kind of what we do for models. We kind of wanna black out a region, but we don't want, you know, we don't want the doctor to say, there's literally a black square on your chest. Cause then maybe they're gonna think there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with the machine. And maybe that's what our models think, 
when we just black out a square in an image. That's not what we want them to think. We want them to think, okay, you're just not telling me what's there, but you have given me a lot of other information because I can see the rest of the x-ray. So I'll take that and imagine based on that, what's in the region that you're not showing me. And that's how we would, that's how, that's what it means to remove features of the conditional distribution. And that's what you'd hope a doctor would do. So it's kind of analogous to that human situation. And uh, mathematically, what this means, uh, th this is the notation for it. Um, this is how you evaluate um, the, the model with a subset of features. You, uh, if you look at the bottom line, the little f is looking at the prediction given x sub s. Those are the features we have. And then the features we don't have, but we are integrating over the conditional distribution for those features. So that's what this is. Okay, um, but we won't delve on the, the equations too much because we're trying to keep it intuitive. Um, and speaking of equations that we're not gonna <coughs> dwell on too much, one of the cool tables that we have is um, we show how all of these methods are linked to information theory in a precise way if you remove features properly. So it yields information theoretic explanations, you know, not heuristic explanations, but they're really information theoretic. Okay, moving on, the second choice, the model behavior that you choose to explain. There are some different options. There are actually more than these three. Which is the right choice? There's no right choice. And, and our view on this is that any choice provides some valuable information. They're, these are just different perspectives on how a model works. And the right choice really probably depends on your use case. It's like, do you want to explain to a person um, what is driving their prediction that they didn't, that they're like not happy about? Are you trying to explain their individual prediction? Are you doing more of a like feature engineering thing and you wanna see which features are really valuable for your model? Um, which ones you maybe don't need. There are different use cases and the right model behavior to explain is kind of use case dependent. So no right choice. Okay, for the third choice, the summary technique. Well, to talk about whether there's a right choice here, it turns out it's helpful to know that every summary technique, um, everyone that we documented in these like 25 methods has some precedent in cooperative game theory uh, and game theory. Ooh, maybe that's a little surprising, but maybe for the SHAP is based on game theory. <laughs> and what's important about that is game theory has been thinking about set functions and how to uh, quantify the influence of different, uh, different, basically different indices to set functions, but they call them cooperative games. They've been thinking about that for decades. So, with the different possible um, summary techniques, they've laid out different properties that you might wanna have satisfied. And uh, with each summary technique, you can say, which properties does this satisfy? And it turns out there's one summary technique that satisfies a lot of good properties and it's the Shapley value. Um, I won't list them, but if you've, if you've read one of these Shapley value papers, they often have a section where they list the nice properties that it satisfies and for that reason, um, we shout out this one as the summary technique choice that is most compelling. This is the equation for it. It's a little bit complicated, um, but it's sort of like, remember the remove individual technique? You probably got the sense when you're removing an individual feature, you're not really accounting for the interactions. And remember the include individual technique where you have no features and you just include one? <coughs> There, <coughs> sorry, you're also not really accounting for the interactions. The Shapley value solves this by adding in individual features, but in every possible ordering. And by doing so, it gives a much more nuanced view of each feature's um, role in the model. So that's why it satisfies a lot of nice properties. And I won't, uh, I won't list them now, but uh, among all the different uh, techniques that we saw in the literature. We thought that this one is pretty compelling. Okay, and here's how every method has a precedent in cooperative game theory, but won't dwell on that too much either. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna wrap it up now. Um, just give a couple concluding thoughts. Okay, so 
uh, just to summarize, we, this, this paper, this talk, tried to present a new perspective for understanding uh, different explainability tools. Um, we also tried to develop some rigorous foundations for them by showing how they're linked to, to psychology or philosophy. Uh, they're linked to information theory. They're linked to cooperative game theory. So they're not just heuristics. They really mean something and uh, we can think about the properties that they satisfy, trying to make this more rigorous. And big picture, we hope that this is useful for both practitioners and researchers. And since a lot of people here are probably practitioners, I'll um, give a couple practical lessons. The first one is when you're choosing an explainability method, it's probably a little bit easier to think, <coughs> you know, I'm just choosing between these existing methods uh, and maybe I'm just choosing between Lyme and Shap. But really what this shows is that because you can just interchange the choices of different methods. It's, you really have a lot more choices than you know. Um, you're not just choosing between Lyme and CHAP. You can have a hybrid between Lyme and CHAP. Remember any empty cell in that grid from several slides ago at this point is a new method that you can run. So you have tons of options. You can run tons of different explanation methods and uh, that's good, but it also means now, and this is the second lesson, um, that it's really important to consider what the right choice is for your use case. Maybe SHAP isn't always the right method. Lime isn't always the right method, you know? So with the power to run uh, hundreds of different ex explainability methods, you really have to think about the right choices. And uh, the third lesson, and this is a little open-ended, but if people have specific questions about it, we can get into it. I think removal-based explanations are well-suited to many applications of explainable AI, there are certain things that maybe removal-based explanations are not uh, the best choice for. But nonetheless, it is helpful to um, now have this perspective where we can say that all of these methods are removal-based explanations. Because before that, it was just 25 different methods. Okay, so with that, maybe we can open it up to some questions.